When it comes to church offerings, many believers wrestle with the question, just how much am I supposed to give? Does the Old Testament tithe still apply? Or is this a question for each of us as believers to decide on individually? Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg provides clarity with a message about the pattern for giving. Our question is essentially, what does the Bible teach about tithing? And we can say two things. First of all, that tithing was the basic pattern of giving in the Old Testament. Now, just so that we're absolutely clear, a tithe is a tenth part, a tenth part of anything. And it may well be that uh, it was used simply because human beings have ten fingers and ten toes, and they counted largely in tens. And God, perhaps accommodating himself to those circumstances and making it easy for individuals, established this particular process. And, as we've read in Psalm 24, men and women were to give both that which God had provided in creation and in their lives, because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And from the very beginning, the Jewish people were instructed to bring tithes to God. Of all the material that would be brought for purchase, a tenth of it would have immediately been set aside uh, for the well-being and the purposes of God. The people of God were then to pay their tithes to the Levites. Those Levites then, in turn, were required to give a tenth of their tithe to the priests. And so the principle worked on top of itself. When you read the Old Testament— you discover that this pattern was firmly and fairly established, but in times of spiritual indifference, it fell into disregard. And as a result of that, God had to come to his people and speak to them concerning their indolence as it related to these things. For example, in 2 Chronicles 31, Hezekiah assigned the priests and Levites to divisions each of them according to their duties as priests or Levites, to offer burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, to minister, to give thanks, and to sing praises at the gate of the Lord's dwelling. And then it goes on to identify the the role of the, the priests and the Levites and how the men of Israel and Judah who lived in the towns of Judah brought a tithe of their herds and flocks and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in heaps. And they began doing this in the third month, and they finished in the seventh month. And when Hezekiah and his officials came and saw the heaps, they praised the Lord and blessed his people Israel. By the time you're reading the book of Nehemiah, after Nehemiah has done his initial work and has gone away, he comes back and is distressed to discover that the people who had made these great affirmations about their devotion to God had slipped up on their commitment. And so, for example, in Nehemiah and in chapter 13, Nehemiah says, I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and singers responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, Why is the house of God neglected? And then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. And all Judah brought the tithes of grain and new wine and oil into the storerooms, and then they were in turn made responsible for the distribution of the supplies to the brothers. And so so it went on. Now, that is just to acknowledge the absolute and established pattern in the Old Testament. What does the Bible teach us about tithing? It teaches us, firstly, that tithing was the basic pattern of giving in the Old Testament. It also teaches us, secondly, that tithing is not stated as an obligation in the New Testament. In fact, if you look for tithing, if you take a concordance and look for tithing in the New Testament, you'll be hard-pressed. You will find, for example, the references made by Jesus in Matthew 23, as well as in the other synoptic gospels, to the Pharisees who set their commitment to tithing above acts of justice and of mercy. And Jesus chides them for that very thing. Not directly related to tithing, but nevertheless, it is a mention of the same. When 
we have read the New Testament together. We've said that there is a development in thought in Scripture, and that what we have in the Bible is often best read from the back going forward. Because as things unfold and as they are developed, you would expect to find that what is present in the Gospels will then be worked out in the history of the church as recorded for us in the Acts. And then by the time you get to the letters, either of James or John or Peter or Paul, that these individuals will be providing for us the inscripturated truth of the essential, abiding, significant elements of biblical theology and of Christian living. All of that to say this. When you read the letters of the New Testament looking for the question of tithing, you are confronted by an eloquent silence on the matter. Bottom line, it is just not there. Now, this must surely be significant. After all, someone like Paul, who was brought up in a strictly monotheistic and Jewish home, who was by his own designation a Hebrew of the Hebrews, we might expect that such an individual, in writing to the churches of his day, would have laid down an ongoing abiding place for the Old Testament pattern, or at least have alluded to it as a tangential reference to the principle as it would be applied. But in fact, he doesn't. He doesn't. Now, let me just pause and say something regarding this. Don't think ahead of me here and say, a bag has decided to take on some kind of anti-tithing posture. You're, you're running ahead of me. But I have a ton of stuff in my files, written by people whom I really respect, that tells me that this stuff is where it isn't. And that gets me annoyed. That gets me concerned. Because if they'll tell me that stuff is there when it isn't there about this, maybe they'll tell me something's there that isn't there about that. And maybe they'll tell me something's missing when it isn't missing about something that is present. That's why I say to you, you are sensible people. You need to read the Bible and see if these things are so. So some of you, I can tell by your eyes, you already can't wait to get out of here because you were convinced that tithing was all the way through the New Testament, and you're unsettled already by my comments. Let me quote to you someone that I admire, David Jackman. He says, The New Testament emphasis on generous giving militates against the idea of a percentage levy. Since some would be able to give far more than 10%, and others, for a time, may not even be able to give that. Because if you think about it, the 10% lets a lot of people off a hook, depending on the nature of their disposable income. Creates the notion that instead of everything belonging to God, only a tenth of it belongs to God. So nine-tenths of everything belongs to me. Well, that's wonderful, because I can cope with that, we might say. But I don't like the idea of God invading all of my rooms, all of my finances, all of my bank balances. So I think Jackman makes a very important and helpful point. Now, in saying that, we're not saying something else. In other words, the New Testament does not, and you must check for yourselves, lay down the principle of the tithe. But neither, it must be said, does it set it aside. In other words, you can't find a verse that says, and by the way, the tithe is out of here forever and for good. So it doesn't establish it as a principle, but nor does it in any overt and straightforward way set it aside. Therefore, and I think this is where most of my friends would be coming from, and indeed where I come from, therefore, it is not unreasonable to assume that the New Testament presupposes that the giving of God's people would be more than equal to the standard pattern under the Old Covenant. Now, let me say that to you again so that no one misunderstands me. The New Testament does not lay down the principle of the time, but neither does it set it aside. It is therefore not unreasonable 
to assume that it presupposes that our giving will more than equal it. But that's all that can be said. And when you set it in those terms, you realize how important it is that nobody adopts a legislative position in relationship to this or lays any stricture on the back of any of God's people's necks in relationship to their own personal giving. Now, that's why we read in 1 Corinthians 16, and just a mention or two on it, and then I think I'll just wrap it up. 1 Corinthians 16 follows 1 Corinthians 15. You'll notice that, won't you? And 1 Corinthians 15 is a phenomenal chapter on the resurrection. Paul is soaring the heights of, of biblical theology. He wraps it up with an exhortation in 58. Therefore, he says, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now about the collection for God's people. See? The glory of the resurrection, scaling the heights of theology, descending very quickly and straightforwardly to the elements of practical administration. It, it, it is a matter of significance and concern. The collection was being made for the poor in Jerusalem. This collection, we like to use the word offering, but collection speaks to the mechanism. There had to be some means whereby money was collected. It's one of the hard things, just, as, just in passing, about how we do what we do even as a church. You know, passing things by. It's good insofar as it is a clear and an obvious way to go, but it also is an embarrassment to people who didn't come prepared uh, to put anything in the plate, and we're not trying to obligate them to do so. But, of course, if you put a little bucket at the back, uh, history has proved that some of the most devoted people manage somehow or another to miss it on the way out and therefore deprive themselves of the privilege of contributing in the way that they said they would. The collection was simply some mechanism that would provide resources for God's people, and he is now reminding the Corinthians of what he had told the Galatian churches to do. That's verse 1. And what were they to do? Well, they were to set aside the money in a manner that was regular. On the first day of every week, every, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income. First of all, notice the regularity of it. It was to be on the first day of every week. By this time, you see, by the time Paul is writing to the Corinthians, the first day of the week has been established un equivocally as the day of worship and the day of sacrifice and the day of praise. And uh, you can read that right from the get-go at the end of Mark's gospel, and then you find it in Acts as well. But the, the sense of the importance of it all was in the regularity of it. And I think there is something there for us uh, to pay attention to. Uh, the needs of people are regular needs, and if giving is not regular in its approach, then there will be an irregularity in the way in which funds are provided, and therefore perhaps a discrepancy in the way in which uh, needs are being met. And for myself, I just find it very, very helpful to—I speak both for myself and for my wife—I just find it helpful to operate in this kind of way, because I am by nature rather poorly disciplined. I operate very easily on a subjective basis, and so it's a helpful rod for my back to say that in this way and at this time, this is what I will endeavor to do. And whether that is weekly or monthly or whatever it is, nevertheless, the instruction was for regularity. Secondly, it was to be proportionate. It was to be in keeping with their income. Well, that, of course, you see, it leaves the the burden very much with the person, doesn't it? I don't know what your income is, and you don't know what mine is, and it's probably best left that way. God does, and God really is the one with whom we need to deal, because He's the one who searches our hearts, and He knows whether my giving is in keeping with my income. It may appear good to some. It may appear bad to others. You may, your giving may appear to be quite spectacular, unless, of course, we knew your income that it wasn't in keeping with your income. 
This, of course, is where the idea of a starting point comes in. And when people come and ask me a question, uh, what is in keeping with my income, Pastor? Where would I start? I say, well, you know, in the Old Testament, the pattern was a tenth, and that is a good starting point. If you've never given regularly and proportionately to God, here is a good way to begin. Take a tenth part of what you have and set it aside for God. But set it aside first. If you don't, if you wait to the end of the month, there's no guarantee that you'll do it. And if you do it on a weekly basis, then you will be able to do it perhaps far more consistently. Regularly, proportionately, and also administered properly. Administered properly. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. Now, the importance of propriety and integrity in relationship to funds is absolutely essential, uh, both for the confidence level of all who give, and also in order that we might be certain that what we give will reach its destination. Now, this makes clear the place of the local church, doesn't it? Because Paul here is speaking to Corinthian believers within the gathered company of them. The same would be true of the Galatians and so on. And the pattern that we have always thought to be wise and helpful is the pattern that's established back in Acts chapter 4, where it says that the people in Jerusalem brought their gifts and brought their substance and laid it at the feet of the apostles, trusting that God would order the apostles in such a way that they could be relieved of the burden of having to decide what to do with everything and where it goes and in order that these individuals would take on that charge. Well, we no longer have apostles at whose feet we may leave uh, our gifts, but we do have the church as it has been established, and we have elders of the church who have been given the responsibility to exercise oversight, and spiritual oversight covers the financial affairs. And for those affairs as well as others, each of us will give an account to God. But let me say this to some of you from whom I hear this coming back. Well, I don't give to Parkside anymore because I was at the meeting and I saw how much money they have. They don't need any more money, so I'm going to give it to people who do need money. I understand the logic of that, but you're wrong. Because the place of giving is first and foremost the local church. For example, and uh, this may seem self-serving, but there's no, other way, there's no other way to quote the verse without quoting the verse. Galatians 6.6, 6, anyone who receives instruction in the Word must share all good things with his instructor. In other words, where we are fed is where we first contribute. That's not necessarily the only place, but it is the first place. That is why, in 1 Timothy 5, Paul is able to say that the elders who take care of the church and do a good job at taking care of the church, who direct the affairs of the church well, are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For the Scripture says, "'Do not muzzle the ox while it is treading out the grain.'" The worker deserves his wages. Do not entertain an accusation against an elder, and so on. I charge you in the sight of God to keep these things. The local church is the place to give adequate and generous financial assistance in its own immediate borders and then far beyond its borders. All of these things, and more besides, happen, continue to happen, and may happen in greater measure as a result of the steady, consistent, regular, proportionate, sacrificial giving of each of us in and through the local church. And when on our radio program we mention the needs, we always say the same thing. If you listen, sometimes you'll hear... This is a listener-supported radio program. After and only after you have fulfilled your commitment to your local church, consider the possibility of partnering with Truth For Life in the cause of the gospel. 
ultimately, you see, this is a personal thing. In some ways, it really is a private thing. That's why it's not particularly easy to talk about or to reference. And it always is a spiritual thing. The writer to the Hebrews says it this way, "'Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess His name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased." You know, I'm tempted really to say in conclusion what Augustine said when he was asked for advice in various practical matters. This is a scary response, I know, but it was Augustine, so you can blame him. He used to say, love God and do what you want. What should I do about my giving? Love God and then do what you want. People do what they want to do. And our wanting, if it is subsumed under a genuine love for God, will change everything, not least of all, the release of our finances for the concerns of the gospel. Describing the biblical pattern for giving, you're listening to Alistair Begg, and this is Truth For Life. To share this message with a friend or to request the complete Grace of Giving series on CD, visit us online at truthforlife.org. I want to affirm what Alistair just shared moments ago. Whenever we invite you to participate in this ministry through your financial partnership, it's always with the understanding that your local church should be the first priority in your giving. The financial health of the local church is important to the whole body of Christ. In fact, our mission at Truth For Life is to teach the Bible because one of our desired outcomes is for local churches to be strengthened. Now, above and beyond that important step, we are deeply grateful for those of you who give in support of this Bible teaching ministry. All of Alistair's online teaching is available completely free of charge because listeners like you have covered the expense. So when you give to Truth For Life, you're really giving to your fellow listeners. And to express their thanks, we want to send you a brief but powerful book that we think will transform the way you approach your time in God's Word. The book is titled, Before You Open Your Bible. The author of the Bible, the maker of heaven and earth, longs to meet with you in the pages of his Word. It's absolutely amazing. And yet so often we can lose our excitement for this amazing privilege. Before You Open Your Bible helps us rediscover the joy of being caught up in the greatest story of all time, the only story in which the central character loves you back. Be sure to request your copy of Before You Open Your Bible when you donate today to reach more people with clear, relevant Bible teaching through Truth For Life. Go to truthforlife.org slash donate or call 888 588 7884. That's 888 588 7884. If you'd rather mail your donation, write to Truth for Life at P.O. Box 39 8000, Cleveland, Ohio 44139. And remember to include a note requesting the book before you open your Bible. I'm Bob Lapine. Next time, Alistair continues his series called The Grace of Giving, reshaping the way we think about our finances and bringing our motives in line with Scripture. Be sure to join us Thursday. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.